Hello viewers and welcome to another episode with Tech Topics. Today uh, we will be discussing the topic commonly known as PDP synchronization or precision time protocol synchronization. PDP is a very well known protocol besides NTP and GPS used to synchronize clocks across hardware systems that are distributed uh, could be geographically, could be in the same uh, data center, etc. But when you have multiple systems that do not have a common reference, PDP is a protocol that can be used to synchronize these uh, remote systems. Having said that, there's multiple standards over time that have been developed. The earliest standard was developed in 2002, and um, then subsequently, the standard was revised in 2008, but the second version in 2008 called PTP version 2 was not backwards compatible with version in 2002. And so recently uh, there was another version announced which was 1588-2019 and this version also known as PTP 2.1 is has uh, backwards compatible improvements to the 2008 specification. So with that background, let's dive into some of the jargon topics that we're gonna to discuss today. What is PTP synchronization? So PTP synchronization, as this figure shows, is a mechanism by which two systems, on the left we show, let's say, system one, and on the right we show system two, uh, how do we synchronize by using messages over a medium such as Ethernet? How do we synchronize the clock or the time between these two systems, the system on the left and the system on the right? And so we describe the key messages that are involved in PDP. The first message is sync, and it says here is the correct time. So if these two systems were of you know, a common time base, then the system on the left, which is serving as the source, or commonly referred to as the master, or sometimes grandmaster, that is going to send a sync message to the machine on the right side, and it says here is the time. And it's sent at time t1, and it's received at time t2, which is the common convention here, but you send the time. Now, you'd say, what is the problem? I mean, that should be enough. Just one message is enough to synchronize two systems, right? The, why, why are there so many messages? Now think about it in a way that when you send a message, the message is not, it's, it's going through a software stack and some hardware and eventually gets sent on the wire, which is a physical cable, and then reaches after a while, reaches the other side, and so it may take milliseconds, microseconds, whatever, to reach the other side, and then it has to go up the stack to some software that can receive that message, interpret it, and set the clock on the right side. So all this, um, even though you did not intention, but there are unintentional delays in the system, and so sync is not enough. And so there are actually two ways by which sync can be done. It's called one step or two step. If the system is sophisticated now enough where you can send a PTP sync message and timestamp saying here's my time at the hardware level so that when the message leaves the left side it actually picks up the most accurate hardware time when the message was put on the wire which is between these two devices. If you can do that and if the time is off and if the time is an early time let's say a software timestamp then there is usually two messages, a sync and there's a follow-up message which actually records the message at which the departure actually took place and it'll say, here's the actual time, here's what I intended to send to you and here's the actual time. So usually there's a two, um, two packets in this and it's called two-step. If the hardware is sophisticated enough where you want to send the sync but it can timestamp right as it goes out onto the wire, then you don't need to send two packets and one packet is enough and is usually called the one step method. Next two packets are delay request and delay response. Now we said that it is possible to um, set the clock on the right side, but there's some delays in the network. And based on how long it takes to go from point A to point B, 
the delays can offset this time as well. It's not just as simple as, hey, here's my time. There's also delays which might affect you. So you want to know what the, the delays are so that you can compensate on the right side and get the actual accurate time, which is exactly the time on the left side, precisely and exactly the time independent of how much delay there is in the networks and independent of all the other delays, you want to set it precisely as it's on the left side. So you need two more messages. Delay request is going this way and the the target device which is trying to set its clock sends a delay request saying at some time T1 it sends saying here's I want to know the delay and it's recorded is received here and the time T2 is recorded and then at some time T3 you can send it back saying Here's my response back, which carries, you know, all these times of the T1, the T2, the T3, and the T4, which is received here. And once the second device receives all these four times, it can compute the bidirectional delay, and it can then compensate for the time error on the right side. So that's, in a sense, a high-level view of what PDP synchronization is. You are able to compensate for you know what the time should be and if there is any errors in the time because there's delays involved you can measure those delays and set the clock accordingly so you end up with a very precise clock depending on the kinds of oscillators you're using you might have a very high quality clock on the right side and a very good synchronization So we discussed one step and two step and just to iterate that when the timestamp is sent to the other side over a wire, the timestamp goes to some sort of software queue and then reaches the hardware phi and then goes out on the wire. If you did your timestamping in software, there may be quite a bit of delay. There may be milliseconds of delay before you get onto the wire and that error would be there and would cause the other side to think that that's the time when you put the packet on the wire, but indeed you did not. That's the time when you timestamp in software. So in one step, you end up with a very sophisticated physical layer hardware that can timestamp the packet as it gets out on the wire and insert, insert the timestamp as it's hitting the wire. So that's a one step. If you don't have that kind of sophisticated file layer, then what you do is that you would send this packet and record the time when this packet passed the file, and in the subsequent uh, message, you would say, by the way, this message actually was delivered to the wire at this time, and that message is a follow-on message, and therefore it becomes a two-step. Next, we discuss the concepts of boundary clock and transparent clocks. And boundary and transparent clocks are just different kinds of clocks that are used within this network. As time travels, you're trying to synchronize one device on this side to the device on the other side, but you have to go through this network. And when you send these PTP messages that we discussed earlier, they incur delays and congestion and all kinds of stuff as they go through the network, which affects the accuracy of the PTP itself. So in order to make PTP highly accurate, there is two options, which also allows you to scale the network. Um, because what happens is that in PTP, all these devices that want to synchronize to uh, a given device are actually talking to this device. So uh, a, any given server can only support so many end nodes that are talking to it. So there's questions of scalability in PTP and there's questions of congestion in this middle box that when congested is having variable latencies and PDP is not able to deal with that. So the two kinds of clocks that the networks in the middle have are called transparent clocks and boundary clocks. In transparent clocking, what happens is that we, as the packets are going, let's say from main to E1, the middle box, if it's a transparent clock, it corrects for the time the packet took. So if this box was congested and the packet stayed there for 10 microseconds, it will know that the packet came in here and exited here and took 10 microseconds and it will correct that uh, error that is on the PDP packet and so that the end device knows that the delay incurred here can be compensated. So that's a transparent clock. In line, it 
corrects the offset or the errors, but it doesn't help scale because still the end devices are talking to each other. This main device is talking to E1 and E2 and so on. The boundary clocks, on the other hand, help attenuate this problem of scalability. When the main gets main system talks to the middle system, it terminates that information and generates the clock itself and therefore it can act as a source of clock for E1 and E2 and in this case the middle box serves as a boundary clock. So in short it terminates X as a slave on this side with the main and then it becomes a master on this side and thus sends its clock to E1 and E2 and therefore improves scalability of the network because now main is only talking to one of these middle boxes and therefore it can hook up to many more other middle boxes. There is yet another kind of clock known as ordinary clock and in the case of ordinary clock that is not the network clock so the end devices can act as ordinary clocks and there are grandmaster clocks, there are slave clocks and there are some special kinds of clocks that can that are normally slave but if the masters disappear, they can start acting as master for the network. So in short, that is a quick summary of PTP synchronization. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, do give me a thumbs up, leave me some comments and subscribe so that you get notified of new content that appears on this channel. Once again, I thank you for spending the time today with me and hope to see you very soon in future. Take care and bye-bye.